Hi, I'm Larry Taylor. Thank you for joining me as we work our way ever so carefully through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. In chapter 7, beginning in verse 13, running through the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus illustrates with five contrasts. First of all, he tells us that there are two different roads. There's a wide road that is just normal life, the way most people live it, leaving out the most important thing, which is God. Nothing necessarily wrong with anything they're doing in their lives. They may be very good, normal people. That's the point. But they've left out the most important thing there is. They've left God out. They've gone through life and never met Jesus. If you go through life and never meet me, you haven't missed much. You haven't missed anything. But if you go through life and never meet my Jesus, you've missed everything. Two roads. Being a real disciple of Jesus is hard. You have to turn the other cheek and love your enemies and not resist evil when evil is done to you. You have to lay down the sword and pick up the cross. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. It's difficult. But we have the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, and we have the encouragement and strength that comes from the community of faith. And those things together enable us to be followers of Jesus. That's the first contrast that Jesus gives. The second one is a contrast between sheep and wolves that look like sheep. Jesus says in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. And we talked at length about that in our last study. There are many false prophets around. And we talked about how we can recognize them. Always without judging, always without claiming to have the kind of ability to judge the way God judges. We don't know people's hearts. We don't know motives. When we say, when we recognize someone as a false prophet, we're not saying they're beyond hope or they're not God's children or we're not saying any of that. We're just saying, when that person proclaimed that thing, uh, he was off base. That was not the will of God. So beware of false prophets, Jesus says. He says you'll know them by their fruits. And then he says, giving another contrast, but in the same context, he says you'll know them by their fruits are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but a diseased tree bears bad fruit. Bad in the sense of inedible. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Now, once again, we mentioned this in the two roads contrast, the road, the contrast between the broad road that is easy, the one that everybody takes just naturally that winds up leading to destruction versus the narrow road, which leads to abundant, flourishing life. Uh, when we were talking about those roads, we pointed out that it's important not to tr read into what Jesus said said more than what he said. We want to take the text just as it is. Now, Jesus did not say that the broad highway that most everybody's on is going to wind up with all those people being tormented in hell. That's not what he said. 
I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that goes beyond what Jesus said. He's, destruction doesn't necessarily mean eternal destruction. What he is saying is that a person on that broad way, that life that is the normal way that most people live their lives, that that person uh, has missed the most important thing in life. They've missed true life. They've lived, they've missed true light. They have not understood what the real essence and meaning of life is all about. Destruction. Here, too, we need to be careful that we don't read in more than what Jesus said. Jesus says that um, a healthy grapevine brings forth clusters of uh, sweet, edible grapes, either to be eaten or to be squished into juice and fermented into wine. He says that that healthy grapevine doesn't bring forth thistles. On the other hand, a thistle bush doesn't bring forth beautiful grapes. And so it is with every kind of uh, vegetable and fruit, whether it's a vine or a tree or um, whatever. If it's healthy, it brings forth healthy fruit, good fruit. If it's not healthy, it brings forth fruits and vegetables, which are inedible. They're no good to us. And if you have a fruit tree, if you're, you know, you have an orchard, and one of your fruit trees, or maybe you have a vineyard and one of your vines, year after year, no matter what you do to it, you keep fertilizing, you keep pruning, you keep babying it, you keep doing all the things that, that uh, people with vineyards and orchards do, but it never bears fruit. Eventually, you're going to remove it. You cut it down. And what do you do with the branches and trunks that you've cut down? Well, they're going to wind up in the fire, maybe in the house, heating the, heating the house, or maybe in the stove that you cook on, or the campfire, whatever. But what Jesus is not saying, and here we would be reading into it, he's not saying that those that don't bear fruit, that God's going to throw them into an eternal fire of hell where they're going to be tortured forever and ever. That is not in the text. That's going way beyond what Jesus say, said. That's reading into the text. That's called eisegesis. Exegesis is looking at what does the text say. Eisegesis is bringing my ideas and reading them into the text. And too often, that's what we do. Too often we look at texts of Scripture, and we're not exegeting them, we are eisegeting them. We are reading into them what we have presumptuously assumed is the meaning. We're looking at them through... Uh, a particular set of biases, uh, perhaps a particular kind of theology. And, and we see this all the time. So if, you, if you're a diehard five-point Calvinist, then you tend to read all Scripture through the lens of Calvinism. If you're a universalist, you tend to read all Scripture through the lens of a universalist, dismissing passages that might challenge your opinion, and emphasizing the passages that seem to support your opinion. That's eisegesis. It's not exegesis. So, back to the text. Jesus says, A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. 
Jesus is simply saying that a life that is lived in connection with God, a life that is drawing its life source from God, a life that is rooted and founded in a personal relationship with God through Jesus the Messiah, is going to automatically produce fruit that looks like Jesus. We are told by the Apostle Paul that the fruit of the Spirit is love. I often hear people talk about the fruits of the Spirit. But again, that's not what the text says. The text says the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is, singular verb, love. It does not say the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so forth. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. I think to properly punctuate that verse, those verses that Paul wrote, uh, one would probably punctuate them uh, something like this. The fruit of the Spirit is love colon, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Because you see, those other eight things, those other eight attributes, are all a part of what it really means to be filled with the love of Christ. Romans 5.5 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit is given unto you. God is love, we are told repeatedly in 1 John. That's the very essence of God. That's who God is. At the very core, God is love. So if I am connected with God, if I'm connected to God, I'm going to produce Love that looks like God's love. What does that love look like? Well, it looks like the cross. It's cruciform. It's cross-shaped. It's love that looks like the cross. It's self-sacrificial. It is willing to die, but not willing to kill. It forgives unconditionally. It is the love of a servant. It washes people's feet. It goes the second mile. It turns the other cheek. It has freely received, so it freely gives. It's full of generosity. It's full of compassion. It's full of care for all others, but especially for those who are marginalized by society or disenfranchised from society or scorned those who are the others those who are scapegoated the victims of racism the victims of xenophobia those who are marginalized you know the homeless the mentally ill the incarcerated people like that it's a love that particularly reaches out for those kinds of people. It's a love that forgives and forgives and forgives. Seventy times seven, it never stops forgiving. It's a love that looks like the love of Jesus as he was hanging there on that Roman gibbet and he looked at those who were torturing him to death and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's what this love looks like. And if you're connected to Jesus, then the love of Jesus flows through you and you act like Jesus. By their fruit, you will know them. You can tell that the grapevine is healthy because you get big clusters of juicy grapes. You can tell that the apple tree is healthy because it has great, big, juicy, ripe apples. Or the orange tree or whatever. And you can tell 
that the believer is healthy. When she acts and thinks and speaks like Jesus. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And my father is the vine dresser, the husbandman, the gardener. And my father lovingly cares for the garden. And he prunes away that which is not bearing fruit, and he props up that which is dragging on the ground. And he fertilizes so that it will bring forth fruit. The branch simply has to abide in the vine. You don't walk through an orange orchard and hear the branches crying out, Oh, I've got to try harder to make oranges. Oranges just naturally happen. As the sap flows up through the trunk and out through the branches, the blossoms bloom and fill the air with their sweet fragrance. And then the blossoms give way to the oranges which grow to ripeness. So it is our responsibility to abide in Jesus, to spend time every day focused on Jesus, living, listening to Jesus, connected with Jesus through prayer, through meditation, through deep contemplation of the scriptures, most especially the things that Jesus said. And to rest in his gracious presence so that his wonderful, glorious life can just flow through me. I don't want anything in me to block that. I don't want anything in me to hinder the flow of God's spirit through me Oh God, search me and try me. And wherever there's any blockage blockage of any kind, remove it, Lord. Take it away. Anywhere where there's a, a, a kink in the pipe, straighten it out. So that your spirit, oh Lord, can flow unhindered, untrammelled through me so that I can be a vessel of blessing to others, so that others will see Jesus. Jesus is the fruit. God is love. And as my life is lived in Christ, it be little by little, it takes a long, long time. The greatest progress is always excruciatingly slow. But as I abide in Jesus, and over a period of many, many years, he works within me, and my character is formed, become more and more like him. And by the way, it's never too late to start on that process. And as I rest in him, slowly, I become more and more like him. We become like what we worship. So the more time I spend pouring out love to Jesus and worshiping Jesus, worshiping the true and the living God, whoever lives as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the more I do that, the more I'm becoming like God, and the more others will see God. You and I are the only gospel that most people are ever going to read. Most people will never know anything about God except what they see in us. What do they see in us? Criticism? Judgment? Are we known for what we're opposed to, or are we known for our love? Oh, God, give us compassion. Oh, God, cause us to be branches just abiding in the vine, bearing fruit that brings honor and glory to you, and leads others past ourselves and into your arms. Amen.